So uh, I'm Hans Johansson. Um, you, you can see from my video background, if you can see it, that I'd rather be in a happy place when we're allowed to travel again here from in the States. Um, but I do appreciate the organizers for this uh, uh, wonderful online uh, workshop. It's been really fantastic and uh, I'm learning quite a bit. Uh, so uh, I'm coming at this from a different perspective of already having an, uh, a series of applications that are adaptive in space time and asking uh, what are some of the parallel in time opportunities and issues, uh, especially for hyperbolic PDEs. Uh, it keeps getting brought up that uh, there are different beasts. Uh, I've really appreciated uh, some of the analysis. I don't know if any of you saw Martin Gander's talk yesterday morning at uh, it was 7 a.m. my time, uh, but it was well worth it. It was a great talk and uh, I, I know the recording will be posted too, so that's, that's available to folks. All right, so um, I'm at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the Computational Research Division. Uh, we're a Department of Energy Lab, which means I have to thank my uh, financial overlords and funders to, uh, who provide uh, funding for this kind of research. And uh, again, thank you again for giving this opportunity to, to talk. So um, again, I'm gonna motivate it. And uh, Gemma, you asked specifically any of those N uh, issues uh, or end faults, I'm going to blatantly use flashy pictures and movies off the start here. Um, so this is one example of an adaptive mesh refinement application that we do in our group. Uh, it's an application code called Bicycles, uh, Berkeley Ice Sheet, uh, blah, blah, blah. We'll leave it at that. Um, and it's about Antarctica. And if uh, for those of you that don't know how big Antarctica is, it's, it's pretty much as big as the US. Uh, and it's basically covered in uh, one to two kilometer thick chunks of ice over more than 95% of the, the continent. And in fact, if you melted all that ice, it would be about five or six meters of sea level rise. And um, I don't have a picture of it, but if you actually uh, uh, map out what Antarctica would look like, it would look a little bit like an archipelago in uh, Indonesia once that is all melted. So there's a substantial part of this continent that's actually under sea level already. It's just being spared by two kilometers of ice. So it's very important, of course, to figure out what's going to happen there. And uh, the application that we have is to simulate the entire ice sheet uh, with a 2D simplification that makes it a little easier to, to scale out. And then we add adaptive mesh refinement. And adaptive mesh refinement here is zeroing in on these right picture, the, the red line, which is called the grounding line. It's the location where the ice sheet goes from resting on the ground, even if that's below the ocean level, to one where it's floating. And therefore, it is already committed to, to uh, sea level rise. And uh, I won't uh, show a movie of this one, but this uh, adaptive mesh refinement starts off with four kilometer mesh everywhere over Antarctica, which is doable. It's not, that's not a supercomputer problem yet. And then it zooms into 250, milli, uh, 250 meter resolution by factors of two. So you can kind of see the outlines here of, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the outlines of uh, the green domain, which is a two kilometer mesh, the purple here, which is uh, a one kilometer mesh, and then finally 500, 250 meters. And uh, when we're really trying to get a good result for this, we have to go down to sometimes 100 meters or 50 meters. Um, uh, because this is just the point at which you can resolve the sharp interface. Now, even though this is a parabolic problem, it has a kink in it. And uh, per Jan's talk, uh, it changes the convergence properties of the numerics. And so you have to be very careful about uh, how you treat the domain around that kink. And it requires a lot of adaptivity. Uh, but it is uh, solved implicitly since it's a parabolic problem. And that grounding line uh, is really key for conservation. Um, I do finite volume methods that tends to be what we do in our group. and the primary reason for that here is that the ice must go somewhere. You have to figure out whether it's going to accumulate or if it's going to flow. And uh, that is a primary goal of trying to simulate this over a long period, which is to get uh, dynamic adaptive mesh refinement to actually uh, track those kinds of things with enough resolution that you can do long simulations. You can move things dynamically, keep track of this from an accuracy standpoint and conservation at the same time. Uh, that's actually one of the questions uh, I would have for folks uh, if anyone wants to follow up is uh, what kinds of parallel and time algorithms uh, respect the conservation properties in space, even when they might not have been iterated to convergence, for example. 
Um, so uh, another example, uh, this is an application that I've worked on. This is a simple 2D model of uh, a cubed sphere. So imagine we lived in an aqua planet and this was just a shallow water equation model for it, but it's the full nonlinear shallow water. And uh, another AMR example where we have only maybe 6,000 points covering the sphere uh, at the base level. The next level of refinement is actually a factor of four refinement, and that adds only another 4,000 points because it's re relatively compact around these two vortices. But if we had done the whole globe, that would have been 100,000 points that we added. And then finally, we add one more level on with a factor of four refinement, so a factor of 16 overall, which again is 20,000 points, but it would have been almost 2 million uh, had we done that uniformly over the globe. So the adaptivity is really important, and uh, here's my flashy movie I'll bore you with. Um, so this is closer to what Jan was talking about and some others, uh, especially the uh, all at once space-time DG folks. Um, these uh, patches are moving around and refining the areas where you specify a criteria around error, error or some physical property like vorticity or shear rates or things like that. And so um, this is a fairly complex algorithm. Uh, that's a fourth order operator and it's factors of four refinement and it's fourth order in time, but it is explicit. So it is a hyperbolic problem in that nature. And when you do these kinds of problems uh, with AMR and hyperbolic problems, you can do what's called subcycling. What, what that means is uh, you will take on this left side that course base level. The red dot means all of the work you might consider to be a time step. And then what you do is you say, OK, now I can provide boundary conditions from the course to the fine for the next finer level. And so these red dots here are fine time steps, in this case, only a factor of two refinement. <clears throat> And when you're done with one of those time steps, you can again provide boundary conditions for the next finer level, and you take those time steps. Now, at some point, you need to synchronize all these things up because you've only been passing information from the coarse grid to the fine grid. So what brings it back is to uh, effectively restrict or average down in finite volume language your, your fine solutions back to your course. And in addition to that, you have to do a lot of times a, a fix up around conservation because you want to make sure that those um, those average down properties then put it back in some kind of flux divergence form where you know you're conserving the quantities you care about like density or ice thickness or things like that. So every one of these red dots here is kind of what we've all been talking about, which is now a series of operator split implicit explicit. Uh, this is a, a six stage fourth order RK scheme that I use IMAX scheme for that uh, problem when it's not uh, just shallow water, but a full atmosphere with uh, kind of stiff vertical terms uh, because of the acoustic and gravity waves in the vertical directions. And each one of these dots here is the full on uh, operator that we might have for exchanging ghost cells in parallel and calculating finite volume fluxes and then finally calculating an operator in parallel. And uh, these are all nonlinear. And in general, this explicit part we all know would be uh, limited by uh, some kind of CFL condition that has physics from one direction. And then the implicit part, again, we're doing the solve multiple times per time step, all levels, uh, but out of sync. So the top, the finest levels are, are solving at a different rate than the coarser levels. But for this one, we have, again, a nonlinear vertical uh, implicit system where the time integrator is second or fourth order accurate. There's no CFL constraint, but there is an accuracy constraint. And for this one, uh, it's another system where you'd say, oh, it's just a wave equation in the vertical, but it's nonlinear. Uh, the way it couples to the coarser levels in terms of boundary conditions and time accuracy is very important. I won't uh, bore you about that. Some of you, I think, I may have bored in the past about that. But there are um, lots of subtleties here when you start accumulating these multi-physics AMR um, time adaptive codes. OK, so that's as complex as it can get. Let's uh, talk about a simple 1D example and, and be subtle about it. Um, so this would be, for example, a coarse grid, a finer grid, and the finest grid for these two levels of factor of two refinement, and it's just in the x dimension. And then we're going to do the time dimension here so you can kind of see how it would look. In a lot of cases, uh, if you're taking a single global time step, you have a, whoops, sorry, you have a barrier. And that barrier is a synchronization point. It's the end of your solver. It's whatever it is. Um, and that could be uh, something that can be done in parallel. But in general, you cannot start the next time steps until you've hit that barrier and synchronize your solutions. Now, sometimes you can stagger or juggle these, like, uh, for example, the PFAST or um, 
uh, other things that were discussed yesterday. But that's more or less what you're stuck with. And so this creates an issue where you don't have a lot of parallelization in time unless you do something more sophisticated like what a lot of people have been talking about here. But it is parallelizable in space. And if you have enough of that, you can really push it very, very far. So it's good in the sense that load balancing is easy. You know exactly how many points each domain has. It's not changing necessarily, except when you move the grids around. Um, but it's bad in the sense of you have a coarse CFL that is way more restrictive than your fine CFL. And your fine CFL, for example, might be the thing that is limiting uh, your explicit uh, operator. So therefore, this tends to get used more with parabolic problems that are implicit. And uh, because of that, it has a global coupling, so the barrier makes sense, and therefore you can do nonlinear Newton iterations or whatever it is that your solver needs for those kinds of implicit nonlinear problems. So then the second thing I was talking about is a much simpler version with local time stepping. So for this one, you really jump on that CFL condition at the course levels, and you can take a huge jump. And let's say we have a classic um, kind of delta T over delta X ratio has to be the same CFL constraint. And therefore, uh, that barrier at the end of it could be the point at which we go back and we take a half size time step on the finer mesh. <clears throat> Again, same CFL condition. We're providing the boundary conditions from the course grid that we've completed already, and so on. We can do that for the next finer level with its two time steps and its barriers. And at this point, the two finer levels are synchronized. And I have to go back and provide course boundary conditions again, and another one for the finer time step. So now I'm done. I'm at the same point I would have been on the left side, but I've done it only for the points that needed it at the CFL condition that they have. And again, very easily distributable. Um, so that's not the problem. It's good because this local CFL means less work and it parallelizes well in space, but you do have these coarse fine synchronization points where you can't move forward with one before you hit another. And so therefore it tends to be better for explicit or hyperbolic problems because of the domain of dependence and the things you need there. So that, that's kind of the simple cartoon model for motivating a 1D example. <clears throat> now, of course, in the second case, uh, our parallel in the time scheme would probably have to think about the connection of coarse fine interfaces in space time. And that's something I want to work on with people. So if anybody's interested in talking to me about that kind of a subcycling problem, I'd be, uh, I'd be curious to uh, try out some algorithms. All right, so that was the time view. Let's now look at what would it be in terms of a work-based view. So suppose our unit of work is just advancing one cell, one step. What's going on there is that uh, in this global time step, um, uh, we have more cells, right? Even the covered ones underneath, if I ignore those, um, uh, which you actually don't with an implicit solver, for example, you try to build up the solution in a way that converges. So now I've stretched out in the work direction because I'm solving more points per time step. Therefore, it's more work. It could be a factor of two, could be a factor of four, depending on how many um, efficiencies I have around this process. So that's the work axis now. So assuming that I have, uh, that's more like wall clock time, assuming all, all else is equal. And again, you can distribute it in parallel that way, but again, we're not distributing in parallel in time. So with this local time stepping, because of those domain dependencies, even though I have much less work per time step, because uh, I'm working on the coarse grid first and the next finer grid, and they're all about the same size in this case, but they're serialized. And so this creates a problem where I can't start the parallel work in time until I've advanced coarser levels. And so this is okay if the work is faster as a result of that, and it's good if it's perfectly load balanced, right? But it's an absolute disaster if that load balancing gets out of whack. If I've somehow given one domain, and this happens sometimes, if you have only one patch, it's the smallest efficient patch you could do, it is holding up all of the coarse grids, all of, all of the, its uh, finer grids, um, and it could potentially be a lose-lose against the global time step uh, option. So that's kind of the view of this uh, local time stepping subcycling. And I, the, the right-hand picture is the one I want to fix for hyperbolic problems. So what would be a good way of attacking this? Um, so if we had parallel in time and AMR for hyperbolic problems, we'd want to get good control of the accuracy. We can do that with respect to mesh size and refinements. And we would like the fine grids to advance in parallel with the coarse grids. Uh, a lot of people like the, uh, Rob gave a great talk on mGrid and xGrid and how it could do that. Uh, I know that's the point of uh, uh, MLSDC and PFAS. So there are, there are lots of approaches to try to do that. But I also need to minimize the synchronization here. Uh, the, the theme in 
computational science right now is that the flops are completely free, but as soon as you start moving memory along, or God help you if you move it off node to another node, uh, you're in trouble. So the bandwidth is not free after all. In fact, it's the thing that you should be paying most attention to. And as long as I'm hallucinating, why don't I say that, uh, like everyone else likes to say, I want to use, I don't want to change anything else. I want my science to stay the same and use the same integrators and solvers. Um, so if that's the case, and we are just dealing with linear problems, which you are not, we do our FFTs. And uh, like Mike talked about yesterday in some of the examples, we do exponential integrators, which, you know, they're exact for linear problems. It wouldn't matter if I had something like this uh, step here with two levels of refinement. I would just do an FFT with, you know, Ewald summation to uh, handle the unevenly distributed points. Uh, run it through my uh, exponential integrator with no CFL constraint. I've got good arithmetic intensity and uh, a good n log n solver that I can build up into 2D or 3D. Well, but what's not so good is exactly that, right? The Ewald summation and the aliasing and things that can happen with FFTs uh, don't really fit well with AMR. Um, FFT actually is a bad idea for 3D scaling. Um, this is a, a little pie chart, 99% of the scaling, and this is just a 1024 cube domain, 99% of it is time spent in communication. And this is just across six GPUs. 0.1% is spent in computation. And this is a very high arithmetic intensity uh, uh, algorithm. The flops are free. So this is not the way to go. And uh, unless you have a problem that is exactly suited for this as linear and, and doesn't need a lot of memory or distribution, then it's not gonna work. And there are other more complex ways of dealing with that. And uh, again, uh, exponential integrator, um, nonlinear problems, you end up going and having to use RK anyway. So uh, that's that problem. So, but let's make this assumption. This would be perfect. It would be perfect in space. It would be perfect in time. I could take as large a time step as I want. And if I could get these solutions on this space-time grid to all be computed at once, I would be done. And it's never that simple. Um, but here's that example again, the square wave and the, the three different mesh refinements are marked there in blue and red and green ticks. Um, so I know it's just advection uh, and actually uh, Martin uh, had a great example yesterday. If you want to do, if you're going to do advection, don't do first order and non-periodic boundary conditions because uh, to the end ways that you can uh, fool people, that, that disappears after a couple of time steps uh, just because of all the diffusive behavior. So this is periodic domain, very high frequency content, not dissipative at all. And uh, we would hope that any fine grid doesn't lead to any aliasing on coarse grids. And so the thing we might do first is to do some filtering of any of our resolved waves. And in the case of a square wave, we'd zoom right into those jumps. Um, and we could do a very slow approach, which would be do a filter on the FFT data. And therefore, you could even think the CFL condition would, would uh, in this approach without an exponential integrator, could be much better, right? Because in that filter on the coarse grid, you're removing all the fine um, uh, frequency uh, that, pr that provide the largest eigenvalues, which slow down your CFL condition for time stepping. So you might have a win there. And then you could evolve all those levels independently because they're separate contributions to different wave numbers and then merge them for some high order accuracy in time and you don't get any aliasing in space. So that's the best we could do in this case that um, might motivate uh, a way of doing that. But if you look uh, at what we would be doing in that case, we actually have two levels of four, factor of four or four levels of factor of two. Those are my targets for the application that I started off with. So I have a CFL ratio of about 16 on these domains for a given wave number. I have to be able to handle a, breath, a spectrum that is, that is 16 times wide in terms of wave number, which is a challenge. Immediately, we all think implicit methods. Uh, you could do it explicitly with some carefully tuned things, but it might not be as general as you would like. And because these are hyperbolic problems, it's not about stiff accuracy. Uh, it's uh, more about the imaginary uh, eigenvalue, uh, imaginary access uh, accuracy. And, uh, and domain of uh, stability. So let's, let's um, look at one group that did this. This is a, a colleague of mine, Paul Ulrich, um, who did a great analysis of just this kind of 1D linearized shallow water problems. And he found that the sweet spot for explicit methods is uh, around fourth order accurate. It doesn't matter if you're talking spectral or DG or whatever. And in terms of time integrators, you know, RK4 or uh, strong stability preserving, they were all in this ballpark of getting about two uh, digits of accuracy for every, uh, and, and the, the shortest wavelength that they could actually resolve was about a four delta X mode. 
So uh, if I go back to my finite volume spatial discretizations, and again, you can use staggered, upwind, center differences, it doesn't matter. High order generally has better wave properties, but the communication and bandwidth are a problem there in terms of bigger stencil radius. And I'm not gonna talk about this, but I'm actually really excited about compact implicit uh, stencils, which only require linear solves. You can layer it quite nicely on top of an implicit solver already. Uh, and that'll be a, a future subject to discuss. Um, and then of course, uh, I don't wanna change anything in my spatial code. So I'm gonna look at uh, method of lines, time discretizations, explicit Runge-Kutta methods, uh, my point around imaginary eigenvalues, um, and then implicit RK schemes. Uh, we're gonna have to be A-stable here because the more accurate my spatial, spatial discretization, the more it looks like the Fourier modes uh, lined up along um, imaginary eigenvalues on the imaginary axis. And L-stable, uh, I, I love Ben's talk uh, two days ago, um, Ben Southworth, sorry, um, where he was showing the importance of that. I'm not sure it entirely applies here, but if I did a mixed uh, hyperbolic, parabolic problem, it certainly would. And, but in general, they're gonna require um, iterative solvers. And then of course, there are much more complicated things. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a talk later on today about uh, fully implicit multi-derivative um, uh, or linearly implicit are examples of those. And then of course, extrapolation methods is something I've just learned about, which you could use with any of these things as long as you have some kind of global error expansion that you could take advantage of. So I've got lots of options here. So I am going to bore you as quickly as possible if we set up the constraint that I want a CFL of 16 and this slightly tighter relative error, like three digits, and we ask this not in terms of time step, but in terms of crossing one grid cell for a resolution. This is the approach I've been using most typically, a fourth order centered RK4 scheme, a fourth order centered differences with an RK4 scheme, CFL of one, and that's what the error looks like in one step of a Fourier symbol. So to orient you, this is from zero to pi on the wave number. Um, uh, the right end is a two delta x mode, right? So that would be plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one scattered across the grid. So the middle one is the four delta x mode that we were talking about before. So it goes plus one, zero, minus one, zero again, all right? And then on the far left, we have things that are so low wave number that they look like constants. So we're shooting for a stability region and an accuracy region somewhere in the middle of that chart, a line straight up and down. And this is what we would get for CFL1 for three digits of accuracy for the RK scheme with center differences. So this isn't great, right? We, we barely get 16 delta X modes in this to that level of accuracy. So if I have multi-level um, averaging operators and things like that, those would need a level of accuracy here where they don't contaminate each other's solution. And that's the biggest wave number I can get. So that's not good. I'm nowhere near my CFL of one. And of course, if I make CFL four, this whole thing falls apart. The red on the right side indicates it's unstable in that range of wave numbers. And the green plus here has shifted so far to the left that I have even less wave resolution at this point. So I'm gonna blow through the, blow through the rest of these. Um, but I think, again, this was another thing that got called out. Both your time error and your phase error and your spatial error all on a log plot are a good way to find what's going on with your code. So to keep going with this. So first guess, take an implicit time step. I can't even see what wave number this <laughs> resolves anymore. Uh, a CFL of four is a good aggressive move for one level of refinement, but um, I'm not even getting you know, a couple of digits of accuracy for anything close to what I need to. So let's keep going. What else can we do? Uh, implicit midpoint rule, Crank-Nicholson, in this case for linear problems. Again, barely move the dial on this, but I, at least I had stability. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go to that multi-derivative Hermite interpolant. Now this is a fourth order in space mechanism. And if I'm doing an implicit solve non-linearly, I get some of these things for free with Jacobians. And this would it moved the dial a little bit, but again, so the symptom I wanna point out is here on the left, you can see this flat spot widening quite a bit in the, the error in the symbol. And, and remember, this, this would be zero all the way across to the highest wave number if I were doing Fourier in space and exponential integrator in time. So this is what my cutoff is in terms of a resolved wave that I could actually put down on the grid and move back and forth between my AMR hierarchy and not worry about any of the methods screwing this up. Okay, so quick intermission. Uh, why or why not extrapolation methods? I, I really like this uh, classic uh, ODE textbook, uh, Herrer and Vonner. Um, the second 
uh, uh, book of the series is Stiff Explicits and Implicit uh, Problems. And it's, it's actually a great reference for a lot of these things. They talk about extrapolation methods. This would be for implicit Euler. Notice how it includes a good chunk of the imaginary axis. Um, you do uh, linear combinations of different time step sizes. And you can actually parallelize this in time. There's a great paper by David Ketchison in, in the CAMCOS journal um, where you can say, uh, if you're doing like two steps with half a time step, three steps with a third of a time step, et cetera, you combine these together, you get a fourth order method, and you end up with something that uh, is actually pretty good. Um, what you can't see from this very nicely grainy uh, old school image is that this is actually hopelessly unstable uh, for a, for, it's not a stable at all. And uh, you are limited to basically second order accurate. That's the 90 degree A stability angle. And you're so close. This, this just this annoyed the hell out of me because I thought that if you build these up, you would get an A stable method. But it turns out that you actually have to go way out to like 28th order or something like that, something where round off would kill you in order to get this anywhere back close to a tolerance of 90 degrees for A stability. So this is another area of research I would love to talk to people about do we know extrapolation methods that are a stable and higher order? But you can parallelize them if you do, and you can actually tune your eigenvalues for a spatial operator to make this work out too. So let's go back very quickly. I had a centered scheme. I love this. This is like the worst thing you could do. This is meant to be fourth order accurate in time. And not only am I screwing up the wave numbers that are really easy to get, but I'm also screwing up the high frequency wave numbers, right? So I can't get, I've never seen an instability that screws up both ends of the spectrum. And if you change the parameters slightly, you can screw up the whole spectrum at once. But the thing I wanna point out though, is that this instability is at 10 to the minus third. So it's actually a very small error. So maybe if I get rid of the high frequency components with a fifth order upwind scheme, then I can get rid of all of that instability. And now I'm just dealing with low wave number stability from not being a stable on the method. So maybe there's some hope there. Um, if I did implicit Hermite with the extrapolation for just two of those steps, this is actually an eighth order method. So I couple it with a seventh order upwind method. And now I've got a CFL4 scheme that's almost up at this eight delta X wave number. That's great. Okay, that broke. I tried to do CFL16 and half of my waves are stable. And the highest, frequency, uh, the highest frequency waves, the one I can't actually resolve, the ones that always give us a pain, are actually unstable now. And you can see what that CFL16 did. It screwed up both my amplitude and phase error for these things. So let's back off and just pull out the big guns. A fully implicit Radau 2A scheme, Radau. Um, this is five stages, so that means it's ninth order accurate. I do a ninth order upwind, and again, I'm just getting back to this, to this spot. But at least I'm stable across the entire spectrum for a CFL condition of 16. And in fact, you can push this a little bit more. Uh, I can use a 17th order method in time, and it pushed it even further to the right. So this seems to be heading in the right direction. But now I'm dealing with ninth order method in space and 17th order method in time, and a fully coupled multi-stage implicit Runga-Kutta scheme. And I think I should just give up. <laughs> this, is, this is plenty. So let's say eight delta X mode, that's what I'm gonna live with. I can run it at a CFL of 16 across three, three AMR hierarchies. And that's about all I got. And I ran out of time uh, to talk and for the conference. So um, I'm hoping to finish this up uh, in a follow-on paper uh, for the conference. Um, I'm pretty close. So can we do AMR uh, for parallel in time? Yes, I think we can um, do it in parallel. Extrapolation would be great. Uh, I'm very much interested in looking at uh, ML SDC because the collocation points that you use for Radau scheme end up being the collocation points that you converge to with SDC. So that could be a good way of doing this. Um, can accuracy be, be maintained? Absolutely, yes. But you have to do higher order in both space and time. Uh, hyperbolic problems are very different than parabolic. We have to have all of that high frequency content preserved as best we can across meshes and across time steps. And uh, can we keep it stable? Yes, but we immediately have to commit to implicit methods at these kinds of CFL conditions. And then finally, um, could we get any of the speed up? I mean, that's the whole point of this. We're trying to get better scaling. And compared to explicit methods, we might be able to. Uh, that's to be determined. And theoretically, the space-time solves can be done in parallel. 
So I think uh, I would love to stay in touch with anyone that's interested in this or thinks they have an idea about uh, what I've done wrong or what I could be doing better with them. Uh, so upcoming paper, and I would love to stay in touch with you folks uh, throughout the year. So then, uh, thank you. I, I actually have found this community to be fantastic, uh, inspiring open research community. Um, I love that you're all excited about aspects of the theory and applications and the software. Um, and uh, this is not meant to politicize this, but um, uh, I feel very strongly about this point that, uh, and my lab leadership is behind me on this, that uh, I think we have to be leading by example and fighting racism and being vocal about it. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you.